All right, let me do a proper introduction of our next um, facilitator. Um, she's a very exciting person, very positive, very energetic, above all, very beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from the United States. <laughs> Karine Favre! Welcome to the Voice of Our Bootcamp. Thank you so much for having me, Charles. I'm I'm so honored to be here. And I wow, I love that introduction. It made me feel so special. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I should say a disclaimer, uh, as again, as Charles said, he hit it right there. I'm very bubbly. I'm very energetic, which uh, has gotten me in trouble, but it's also great for this career. But that also means that I tend to ramble and talk fast. When I'm in my studio and I'm recording a script, I am totally professional. But when it's all of us together, all these voice actors, I get a little too excited. So just let me know if I need to slow down. So uh, let me go ahead and I just wanted to run through my credentials just so you guys know who I am and what I'm talking about. So I am from Atlanta, Georgia. When I was four, I knew I wanted to be an entertainer. And by the time I was seven, my sister introduced me to voice acting. And so I would watch Saturday morning cartoons and actually learn the names of the actors. And I'd be like, oh, that's Jim Cummings, again, as a seven-year-old. So uh, to clarify, I didn't get paid as a child, but I did do a lot. I already knew at age seven, I was already mimicking voices and trying to give voices to anything that I was reading or, or anything like that. So it's always been a part of me. I then went to the University of Georgia and received a um, bachelor's degree in performing arts, which fell under the, the umbrella of theater. Because as you guys know, there's not really a, an official college for voice acting. And so while I was in college, I did do my official first voiceover. I was a volunteer for the reading for the blind and dyslexic. And essentially, I was a narrator. So I read textbooks, like science books and stuff. It was kind of grueling, to be honest. I focus on fiction and children's entertainment. If you can't tell, I'm very bubbly, like I said. So um, it was definitely a, a quick lesson in matching and connecting with the copy that you're reading. After that, you know, life got got to me and everything, um, you know, how you, you just need to pay the bills. But luckily, I ran into a vocal coach. So by November of 2013, I had my demo in hand and I went out in the world. I'm going to be celebrating my 10th anniversary as a voice actor this November. Yes, I'm so happy. And... <laughs> And I um, I actually am a recent full-time voice actor. I don't know about all the other speakers. I loved hearing Amrit. I'm like, how am I going to follow up him? He is amazing. Everything he told you is absolutely awesome. I went full-time uh, in February of 2022. So if you guys right now, I, I was hearing some of your questions and you're juggling some stuff, that's okay. That's where you need to be. It's going to be It's going to be tough, but you're going to do it. You're going to be awesome. So I think that's it for me. Oh, um, just as relevant information, because I was asked to cover the techniques, especially for e-learning and explainer videos, and to dabble a little bit into video games. So just for perspective, I've done over 40 e-learning projects and at least 145 explainer videos. I lost count. So I've <laughs> I have done a lot of this stuff that I'm about to talk to you about. So I think I'm a good candidate for explaining this kind of thing. To start, I just wanted to make sure, and I think everybody here, you guys already know this, but there is a common misconception that voiceover is just reading. And actually, I'm going to touch on what Amrit said before about how voice acting or voiceover is voice acting. But that is something that I think a lot of people forget when they do e-learning because they just see it as an instructional. But there's a really famous quote in the acting community, um, which says, an actor must believe to make his audience believe. And we kind of shorten that down to acting is believing. So again, you don't need a degree like I did in acting. Just make sure you commit this to your mind like a mantra, because if you believe, your audience will believe. And this is important because, as I just said, e-learning tends to be boring. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> but you need to make it engaging. That is why you got hired for that job. But if you don't connect with the copy, it'll come out in your voice. So I have actually a great example of this. When I was starting early on with that first coach that I, that I mentioned, I was too bubbly. <laughs> you know, I just came from work to go talk to my coach and I was excited because this is my passion. And I was like a child. I just couldn't sit still, you know. And so she told me, she's like, you need, you need to calm down. You need to really, again, connect with the copy. But I just wasn't mentally connecting with what she was saying. 
So three, four times she said, try it this way. Go, go at it this way. By the fifth time, I got frustrated and I got a little angry because I was like, I don't understand what my coach is telling me. And so I internalized that frustration and the way I said it, ironically, is the way she wanted it because then I was like, well, fine, I don't care. And so I just read it a little bit more monotone, which my monotone is everybody else's regular. <laughs> but that proves my point that whatever you're thinking internally is going to come out through your voice. So it's just just keep that in mind that the script is a story or a conversation no matter what genre you're in. And so before I just go into more detail on that, I just wanted to take a brief step back. And also, actually, if you're interested in e-learning, I have a series on my website that I go into like the history of everything. So if you're really nerdy like me and you like that, I do talk about that. But I'm just here to give you actionable items you can use today. So there are many forms and or genres of voice acting, but two of the most, I want to say basic, but I don't mean as in simple, kind of actually what Amrit said, where it's it's your bread and butter. It's, it's the easiest things to book because they're all over the place is broadcast and non-broadcast. So broadcast is exactly what it sounds like. It's radio or TV commercials. And now there's there's digital too with like streaming and apps like Spotify. So the point of today's conversation, I'm going to say that broadcast has a very broad scope of listeners that are being advertised to. Non-broadcast is essentially more internal, um, and I'm kind of just simplifying it, but this is good to just kind of have in in your mind. So, for example, corporate, um, medical, or industrial narration usually means you're talking to a smaller group of people. You're usually instructing and informing those people. Well, a section of non-broadcast is the explainer video. These days, you might have also heard it be called whiteboard animations. It's just the style that they use to make the explainer video, but whiteboard animations are explainer videos, so you don't have to worry that there is a different, you know, subset within that genre. So explainer videos are usually no longer than 90 seconds. Sometimes they do get pushed to three minutes, but technically speaking, they're not supposed to go past 90. And again, they're geared towards um, a company's consumer, whether that be a client, a patient, a, a patron, any, any other customer identity, right? It's usually for that subsect of client. And just so you guys know, the pay rate is usually based on the length of the video. And it can even be broken down actually like a radio ad. So it'll be, a, you know, a 30 second, a 60 second, a 90 second spot. And those are paid accordingly. Also, just a little information for you guys to know, because I don't think anyone told me about this, but sometimes those explainer videos are converted into a com- what's called a commercial cut. And that's exactly what it sounds like. They reuse the video that you uh, narrated for another use of a broadcast use, either, you know, radio or e- they might just take the voice and do streaming digital. And this is awesome for us as talent because they have to pay an additional usage fee because, again, that's the difference between broadcast and non-broadcast. Broadcast is public. Non-broadcast is usually internal. So if they want to use what you did for non-broadcast, they have to pay the fees to use it as a broadcast. But you as the talent don't have to do a single thing because you've already recorded it. So I really love when that happens because they just come back to us and they're like, hey, can we buy the you should fee? And I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, why would I care? <laughs> so it's awesome. Um, and it, it doesn't happen all the time. But that's just something to kind of be mindful that this can, you know, go out to a wider audience. So you need to make sure that if they say, hey, please keep this at 30 seconds, there's usually a reason why they need that video at 30 seconds, even though it's not a normal commercial that you might be used to. So e-learning presentations, those are much longer, as in like hours and hours long, but they're usually internal to the company's employees themselves. It's not always the case, but that's usually how it's kind of, you know, separated. You know, these genres kind of mix together and and weave. You don't necessarily pigeonhole yourself into one category. So even the categories themselves can kind of interlock and you're like, wait a minute, you know, it makes them... charging a little bit difficult because you're like, what exactly is this? Um, Sometimes you get a brand new thing, especially with technology. But these projects can either be paid per word. It's usually about, well, for um, US dollars, 25 cents. I'm not sure what that would convert to. I'm sorry. Or by the the length of the, the project as well. So you can also do these by minutes or by hours. You can, even though it's, again, it's a little bit weird. You can have an e-learning presentation that's only three minutes long, but usually it is by hour because it's, it's so long. And this is just a personal observation, but I, I think it might help a lot of you 
e-learning often feels to me like nonfiction audiobook narration, kind of calling back to my very first when I was uh, doing as a volunteer reader for the Reading for the Blind and Dyslexic. If you're reading an educational textbook or another instructional manual of some sort, that to me, that's the physical form of a digital presentation because you're reading a textbook that's inf informative, but then the e-learning presentation is, is the digital form. So if you think about it like that, it makes a lot of sense why you need to follow what I'm about to actually say, which is the techniques. <laughs> so, um, and actually I did just wanna say for audiobook narration, I, I just wanna celebrate my win. In this community, we're all about celebrating wins. So I did just celebrate my official 25th audiobook narration, and I signed a contract to do an additional 30 children's books. So I, uh, I have my work cut out for me. I'm very excited. Basically, this has already been said, but this is very important. So if you only take one thing away from this, it's that the script is a story said as a conversation. Because if you remember, voiceover is voice acting and voice acting is believing. So I'm going to give you, it's kind of a, a condensed script analysis because it's the best way that I can explain these techniques. Um, and script analysis comes from acting, but it also, it plays a lot into voiceover and voice acting. Again, these are techniques that I personally use, but they have been taught by additional professional talent who, who taught me. So it, this isn't the only way to do it. If it's not resonating with you, you can obviously find other ways, but these are tried and true. So first, I want to clarify that explainer and e-learning projects are almost always self-directed. This means that the client is not on the voice or video conference call with you. I know a lot of, especially even like commercials and stuff, you'll have them on the phone and you'll record and either you'll do it through Source Connect so they have the, the raw audio or you'll be the engineer and you'll send it over, but you're talking with the client. With um, explainer and e-learning, that's, that's not the case. So what you will do is self-direct, and that means what it, it sounds like. You're the one who tells yourself if it sounds good or not. And you send them your clean, edited work. So you cut out everything that they don't want to hear, any kind of retakes that should not be heard by the client. And then they will provide you feedback afterwards. For the most part, especially e-learning, it's really good to send a sample, um, like a paragraph or two, just to make sure that your cadence or the, the manner in which you speak is what they're looking for. Because you don't want to record three hours and then they say, oh, I was hoping you'd put on a British accent. And I will say with love, clients don't always know what they want. And so they'll ask for something. You'll <laughs> Yes, right. It's a moment of truth. They'll ask for something, you'll give it exactly how they asked, and then they'll be like, that's not what I wanted. And that actually happened, it was a few months ago, I got an audition for, it was an animation audition, and the character was, was female, and then they come back and they're like, actually, no, we're changing it to a male. So sometimes it's, it has nothing to do with you, don't let it get to you. Sometimes it's just the client doesn't know what they want. Again, I, I know that there probably are exceptions that occasionally you will get um, explainer or um, e-learning that is directed by a client, but it's it's very few and far between. Like I said, I've done over 150 explainer videos and not one of them was directed by a client. So now I'm going to go into the actual techniques. The first technique <laughs> is to just review the, the script for content. At this part, don't try to perform it. You actually are just reading, which is something that we don't do in voiceover. But in this part, when you're looking at the script, you are just reading it. You're not trying to perform it because you need to find words that you might stumble on or names that you need to confirm the pronunciation. You might want to write and literally write or put in there, you know, phonetically. If something is said the way it doesn't look like it should be said to you, you, you can go ahead and edit the copy and the script the way that you need to. And this goes for 30-second explainers as well as three-hour learning presentations. It's literally a, a pretty much across the board of all the genres, of all the voiceover. You need to read the script first and make sure you, again, can actually pronounce everything. So now that you have like the skeleton of the script, you know what, what it is and that you can say everything, I'm going to say let's add the meat. So we're building a person. We're building the story. So we have the skeletons. So now we're adding the meat. And that is the knowledge that every product, service, or experience is a story that you have been tasked with sharing. So you have to look at the script and go through a little bit of acting 101, uh, the script analysis. Who are you in this narration? Are you the CEO sharing an update to uh, a tech gadget? 
Or are you an admin talking to her peers about something that's going on with the company or a service? The way that subtle change will change the tone in how you speak. Because, I mean, think about it. Like, obviously, while I'm trying to sound more professional talking to you guys, talking to you, my peers, I talk to you differently than I talk to my clients. It's a little bit different and it's subconscious. But if you keep that in your mind and then go, it will come through your voice. Like I said before, with connecting and really, you know, really feeling the script. And now you have to ask, who is your audience? Are they already customers that you're just informing them of an update? Are we trying to get someone to buy something and they're brand new, never heard of this product? Or are we simply informing them with like a PSA, even nonprofits? If your video is moving and captivating, you can get more donations to help their nonprofit charity. And so that's why you really need to connect with this and know who you're talking to and who your customer or client or, you know, basically your listener is. So I always like to create an avatar for the customer. An avatar is basically an actual picture, an idea in your mind of this person. So here's um, just an example, and I should have brought a script. I'm sorry I didn't. But uh, let's say we have a script in front of us, and it's about an insert, like a, a padding for a woman's shoe. So maybe as you're reading through the script, you're picking up cues and you realize that your audience is a new mother trying to juggle errands and caring for a baby. But thanks to these inserts, at least with her busy schedule, her feet don't hurt. So now you can picture an actual woman who needs this project that you're explaining to. So with that picture in your mind, it again, you kind of, you connect. It's now, it's not just a script. It's, it's for somebody. You're helping somebody. And of course, you're helping your client sell a product, but you know, it's usually, let's think about the listener instead. And then, of course, you have to know what are you talking about. If you can't re-explain or summarize the copy in your own words, you haven't connected with the script. And just to clarify, I'm not saying you do not have to memorize the script. You should definitely read because they spent a lot of time making sure every word in that is is important, especially you guys know this for commercial, um, you know, radio commercials and spots. Every word is precious and put there specifically for a reason. But even in explainer videos and e-learning, if you're reading the, the content and if you're like, I have no idea what this is, then you're not going to connect. So I, for example, I try to avoid medical e-learning because some of the terminology, it just goes over my head. I just don't think like that. But when I do get those, I'll just do some Googling research behind the scenes. So I'll be like, what does this mean? And so I understand. So I say, oh, well, I'm talking about a heart catheter that goes in, you know, it's a stint, that kind of, you know, like, so you understand what you're talking about. That's all you have to do. Just be able to summarize, what am I talking about? And also consider what feature or assistance or benefit is being offered to the listener. Like the example I said before with that insert for that woman's shoe. Yeah, it's okay. It's a piece, you know, you're selling that, but how is it helping? It's giving her just one less thing she has to worry about. Her feet are now, you know, she feels like she can run a marathon so she can, you know, go shopping with a baby on her hip. So think about it that way. Whatever you're doing, that story, that product, that service is solving a problem. So you need to figure out what that problem is and how you're solving it. Because again, you take the persona of that script, who, whatever you're saying, you're somebody either in the company or a peer, another customer telling somebody else that copy. And so just keep in mind, I know I said sometimes the client doesn't know what they want, but keep in mind any notes and directions that they might have given you for the read, because you might be analyzing it one way and they're like, no, 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 it's not a woman, you know, it's not a a mother, it's actually for, well, I can't even think of anything, you know, it's, it's for someone, you know, it's for a man who sits in the office all day, but his foot might cramp, right? And I totally misread the analysis. So always look at what the client wants you to do, but sometimes they don't give you enough. And so this process just helps you bulk out the details of this. So now that we got the skeleton and the meat, let's finish it off. We're making our person all fleshy and nice and smooth. That analogy I know is really weird, but I just, I'm going with it. (laughs) Um, And so that, that smooth texture is the conversation. We don't talk at the listener. We talk to them. 
We already figured out who we are talking to, so now we get to envision them. And if it helps, pull up a picture if you need to. I have actually a, another uh, story. So I coached a five-year-old and a seven-year-old uh, separately, and I couldn't get them to sit still with the proper posture towards the microphone. So what I did was I put googly eyes on the microphone and let the child name the mic. And they both connected. They, they gave them, it was, you know, silly, silly names, you know, like a, an imaginary friend for the child. But they connected and they started playing towards the mic. And it was like magic because now they were, they were facing it because they were talking to their friend. And so that might work for you if you're trying to get comfortable with the mic. The mic is your friend, you know, like you go and you talk to them. I always tell new voice actors, you have to get over that fear or not fear, but the uncomfortable, the awkwardness, even by yourself, even if you don't have a client with you, it's still awkward at the beginning to talk to the mic. So go and, you know, sit in your space and just talk just about your day. You don't have to read anything. Just just talk, talk to the mic because then you'll get comfortable. You don't even have to record it at first. Just get comfortable with that, right? And so obviously you guys are probably past that, but I know some of you just bought your mic, so that might be good advice for you. I'm not sure, but just, yeah, just be comfortable with the mic. It is your friend. And I also, I've heard other coaches have told me that you can put an actual picture of a, f a friend or a, a family member, especially if they meet, meet your avatar, like my friend just had a baby. So I could put her up and then read that thing about that soul insert because I can see my friend. I'm telling my friend, hey, maybe you need this insert so that when you're, you're juggling life, your feet won't hurt, right? And then suddenly you have a personal connection. So whichever method you think will will help you, just have that, you know, mentally. And, and by now, yes, I, I don't put a picture up anymore, but it, it helps to visualize who you're talking to. You automatically make it a conversation. My first coach, she taught me a lot. That's why I keep referring back to her. She told me that the mic is the ear of the listener. So you don't have to shout or project like you would in a lecture hall or a theater. You are right there next to them. And, and if you think of the mic as an actual person, it, it kind of helps. It's a little bit weird to think of the mic as a person, but it does help because it, you, it gives you something to talk to. Okay, so now I have some fast tips. So I'm just going to kind of ramble off some things that I know um, I think would be helpful. Prep your recording area before you record rather than leaning on fixing it in post-production. There are some great uh, techniques that you can use in post-production. Your editing software can really fix anything that goes on, but you shouldn't rely on that because if your space is already quiet, then those editing tools can just make it that much more crisp and polished. So you want to make sure that you fix the things before you record. If you can hear something, you know, chances are your uh, microphone will pick it up. You can always do a test run as well. So say a sentence or two and then listen back. Is that, you know, your neighbor's dog barking? Is that, you know, messing things up? You might need to wait, unfortunately, and, and record at a different time. And then also it's okay and actually preferred to break down the script. Um, you can even fully stop after each sentence if you need to and, and simply just, you know, correct those breaks in post. Those are the type of things that you can do in post-production. So if you said something and you need to really get back into it or, you know, if, if you feel your mind wandering, just take a moment, center yourself back into the, you know, the copy. Remember who you are in this uh, script and who your, your customer, who you're talking to is, and then go right back into it. No one needs to know. You don't need to start all over. And then sometimes you do need to ignore the punctuation. <laughs> you would think, at least I always thought that like, no, the, you know, the script is, is king, right? There can be no changes to it. Sometimes the written word just doesn't sound right when you say it out loud. And the person who wrote that script tried very hard to get all of those key words in there, but they didn't say it out loud to make sure it makes sense or sounds appropriate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the spoken language is a different art form from the, the written form. And so just go with your gut on what sounds correct. Especially, um, I think I might actually cover this later. I, I have a, a bullet point of what I want to say, but explainer videos specifically are very choppy because they are written. You basically get the storyboard. So you'll have your script on one side and a picture of what the video is going to look like on the other side. So the sentence that you have to read is broken up. Sometimes it fits really well if you're doing a list where you have those natural pauses for the bullet points, but sometimes it doesn't sound good the way they have it broken up. And because that broken up, that thing is usually not for you. It's for the person editing the video. 
So just keep that in mind and remember that you trust yourself. You've had training on this. They haven't. <laughs> so they, they lean on you to do what actually sounds good, even if they don't know what sounds good. Also, watch the clock. And I know you've already heard this for broadcast, for radio and uh, television, but explainer videos, even though they're usually not as structured, the client still paid for a 30 second video. And that client is usually, that's the end client. Your client is usually the middleman making the video and they, your client doesn't want to go over what the, what their client paid for, right? They don't want to do more work than necessary. <laughs> so you need to try to keep it to that 30 second or whatever they need. And again, because some of these are converted into commercial cuts, it's important that you are aware of these requirements because that, again, is less work for you on the end. Because if they accept something that it was supposed to be 30 seconds, but you read it at 40 seconds, but now the client wants to cut it down for a commercial cut, now you would need to re-record that because you didn't fit the time limit that they asked for. That's never happened to me. So usually when you submit, they'll know. And just, just to let you guys know, there are times where they will send something to you and say, this is supposed to be a 30 second explainer video. And you say with the word count and stuff, there is no way you can get it under you know 45 seconds. And so usually what I do is I will record it and I'll say, this is the fastest I record. I can record it as a natural human. Then I'll give them a sample of this is what it sounds like post-production where I read it and then I sped it up. I made sure it fit the time and they can hear the difference of how unnatural it sounds. And then I give them what I feel like the video would sound the best with. We were going back with the actual analysis because when you have to read super fast, it is just reading at that point. You don't get to connect with the script because you're so like, okay, I got to go as fast as I can. And I have actually had nine times out of 10, the client will then pay for a, a longer video because they're like, oh, you're right. That other way does sound better. So don't don't cow to them. They'll say, no, 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 fit it in 30 seconds and, and show them. Show them it cannot fit in 30 seconds. And if it does, it doesn't sound good. So just, again, just to kind of let you guys know, it usually does not happen. Usually they're very good. They, I think uh, 30 seconds is always 75 words. So they're very good at the word count. So they will, they'll do that on their end. But it occasionally, especially if you have a new client, it will come up. You have to kind of train them to do <laughs> what, what will work for you. And so much like audiobook narrations, you also need to consider the breaks in the script. And this is mostly for e-learning, not, not so much explainer videos. But with e-learning, a pause between the paragraphs is usually longer than a pause between each line. There's, there's usually a reason why it's broken down the way it's given to you. Section headers and titles should also be given a bit of, of grandeur because it helps the listener know the instruction is now moving on to a separate section. So it just helps to really kind of, again, break down that, that script of the e-learning for the presentation and keep in mind that pause is that non-speaking can also be very important in a lot of places. Okay, yes, and the, here's my thing. Explainer scripts are written very, very choppy. So like I said, just make sure you're not performing in a choppy manner. Perform that script the way that it feels comfortable for you. So now I'm going to go into a little bit more of the video game scope of things. Everything I say here can be applied to e-learning and explainer, but with video games, they are their own genre form, whatever you call it. And they're also, they are a beast, right? Video games has been my personal uh, recent focus. I need to get with Amrit because I heard that he does video games. <laughs> and so currently I've done three video games and nine mobile app games. Again, if you're interested in the, the nerdy side of these things, I have done a history of voiceover in video games. I have it on my uh, YouTube channel if you're interested in all that. But basically where we are here in 2023, video games are immersive storytelling. They're not just the silly, you know, Tetris or, or Ping or Pong, right? Pong. <laughs> You, you know, they, they actually have story. And I want you to think about it, especially if you personally don't play video games. Look at it this way. You might spend two hours watching a movie and you're already connected with those characters. But most video games nowadays are at least over 20 hours long. Think about how much more connected those players are going to be than the movie watcher, right? It's just you spend so much time with them. So I like to say that there is no video game voiceover. It's voice acting. And as we've covered before, voice acting is acting. You just simply have just your voice to work with instead of your face for the camera or your body on stage. 
So if you can't afford acting lessons, it's okay. There are workarounds. You don't need, like I said, you don't need to get a degree like me. I would actually suggest you focus on fictional audiobook narration because it will help you organically walk through the process that acting script analysis does. It really, it really does because you feel the motives and the tactics the characters use to get to their individual goals. Because in that audio, in that narration, you're usually, I guess, first person is usually best. But you'll read, you know, think about like Harry Potter, right? He will say, oh, I don't like Snape. So I, you know, went around the corner, you know, like he's telling you what you should act, right? If that were a character. So you can see the behind the scenes through audiobook narration and organically learn the process of acting that way. Um, And I I really do feel like that's something people don't bring up a lot. But because all of this is all intertwined and connected, these different genres can help each other. You might now be thinking, okay, so that makes sense for immersive video games. What about those silly mobile app games you said? (laughs) First, they are so fun. So don't knock mobile video games. Um, I I used to be embarrassed saying that I did a mobile app game because they were silly like, you know, like Candy Crush type of stuff, right? But if there's a speaking character in that app, they have a story to tell, just like everything else. It might not be super deep, (laughs) but it's still, there's still a story. And so I actually, I recommend getting the Stanislavski system. You can find it on Amazon. It's $16 US, um, you know, American dollars. So it's, it's not too expensive. Probably by now, if you Google that, you can probably find some articles that talk about it for free. So you don't have to buy this. But I really like this because it goes over the techniques of acting that you will actually use for video game voiceover. And yeah, if you just look up his name, Stanislavski is a very important person who in, in acting. So you'll hear him, him and then the Meisner. Those are the two top guys in acting. And look how short this is, right? It's not thick, but this is all you need. You don't need to go and get an acting class. Now, I will say it's fun to take an acting class and it's also fun to do improv. And improv, surprisingly, is very good for voice acting because it helps you think off the top of your head. And a lot of times, especially for character work, they want you to improv. They want you to connect with the character, know the character, and now suddenly you know the character better than the the director himself. So he'll say, well, what do you think your character would do in this spot? If you have improv practice, you'll be more confident to say, I think my character would do this. So while it's not a requirement, it will definitely help you hone your skills and get that much stronger in your your craft. So I do want to clarify that even though your body isn't visible, there's a lot of physicality involved to help you fully connect with your character. Does your character have a limp or a crooked back? There are some things that might not even be in the script necessarily. You might see a picture, but you can guess. If a character is described as, you know, having been a war veteran, chances are, you know, he might have some sort of PTSD, right? So if he says a line that you can take, you can read between the words and say, wow, he's actually really troubled by this. You never say that because it's not a part of the line, but it stays in your head mentally and in your heart because acting is, is believing. You have to believe you're that character and you have to empathize with what that character went through. So it could just be a throwaway and ask, ask your director. They don't, they appreciate when you're assigned in your, your book, a character and you say, how do you imagine, you know, what, what timeline where is this person in the 1800s? Are they in a fantasy land that doesn't line up with earth? Are they modern? Those, all of those questions. And again, that will be in here as well. Will you really break down the character and all of the things? Did they go to school? Do you think, are they an orphan? Are their parents divorced? Do they have siblings? This stuff won't come in your script, most likely, but you will keep it in mind. Because if you're talking and your character is talking to a cute little six-year-old and they have a seven-year-old sister, they're going to they're gonna feel more connected to that six-year-old because they see their sister in that child, right? Those are the type of things, that's this, what's what you need for character work for, for video games. It goes really in-depth, it really does. And no, while you're getting into it, you don't need, you know, this is a practice, so you're going to get more used to it. But there is, and you can actually Google, again, 100% free. Just Google, you know, character breakdown in acting. It'll give you a list of 20 questions to ask that goes through what I just said. So if you, like that, if you didn't write down, it's okay. It's out there. Just realize that any point that you get for acting is going to be useful in voice acting. They're not separate. It's just the way that you get your stuff across. 
So it really is about committing to your character and what sound that might be. And actually, yeah, I have a, I have an example. So look at the movie Avatar, the one about the blue. They look like cats to me. <laughs> that actually is a video game. So th- you have to actually sit there and think what it would feel like to have a tail. Is the tail going to come up in your scripts? I mean, maybe because that's how they connected with the plants. But usually in all of your what you're going to be saying, it's not going to come up in the script. But your character has a tail. So hold yourself like a character who has a tail. Maybe you have to sit differently because you might be sitting on your tail. It sounds silly, but it will get you in that mindset of being the character and you will fully connect. And to a lesser degree, you can still use this in every other genre when you're building who you are in explainer and e-learning. Again, you're probably not going to be an alien with a tail, but you, you might be a housewife. So, you know, think about what that looks like to you and embody that before you read the script because you're really performing the script. You're not reading the script. And then also, so I seem to be specializing in children's mobile app games because, again, I just I have that personality. So it comes to me naturally. And the one, number one rule for mobile app games for children, because they all have their own rules and stuff, is, is to never stop smiling. Even if you have to say like, oh, no, you got that one wrong. Try again. Yeah, I'm still smiling. You got it wrong, <laughs> but it's okay. Try again. You're very happy and energetic. And I'm sorry, my voice is hoarse today, but I actually had to say one time that a character, Mr. Rabbit's house was on fire. I literally had to say that line. So I wasn't smiling, but I was like, oh no, Mr. Rabbit's house is on fire. Like, a, you know, it's a little bit played off. You know, it's like, a, oh no, what should we do? Because they were playing, a, they were a firefighter. So they had to put the, the fire out. But these are for little children, so you don't want to scare them. It's like, oh my gosh, Mr. Rabbit's going to die if you don't do this. It's very <laughs> it's very family-friendly and very child-oriented. And you have to keep that because who your audience is really matters. You're not going to talk like that in a mature-rated game like Call of Duty. <laughs> but in um, Chef's Island, you know, Sibling Island Restaurant, I, I play the main character, Jenny. And she does talk like that. You, you know, don't cut yourself. You know, make sure the stuff doesn't burn on the stove. Like, these are things that, you know, your lines that you really have to kind of commit to. So I just, I have a few more. I don't know how I am on time. Let me know, but I have a little bit more to go through. Um, So usually uh, video game scripts, they're one of two ways. Um, They're usually very similar to animation and other character work if they have heavy dialogue, but they can also have just their lines with a short prompt about what's going on. They can also be either undirected or directed sessions. So just you have to be sure if you're if your director isn't there and usually they already organize them for you. But if your director is new, uh, if you're working on an indie video game, so that person is as new as, as you might be right now in voice acting, they might not have put this in order. So this is just something to keep in mind. Order the lines based on the sound. So, for example, all of the shouts and the death cries, those come at the end because you are going to be hoarse and you are going to hurt your voice because sometimes those things, you know, you can't really scream in a way that's good for your your voice and soothing your voice. There are actually a lot of union laws now. SAG-AFTRA has some union laws for voice acting in video games, specifically because voice talent have ruined their voices doing long bouts of acting. So you have to make sure to be an advocate for yourself and don't go longer than a two-hour max without demanding a break. They don't have to play for the break, okay? You can say, hey, I just need a minute, you know. But make sure you're resting your voice and, again, leaving all of those screaming stuff at the end so you can immediately stop, go get some tea, and and take care of your voice. Also, remember to hydrate the day before so that you're, you're nice and, and you're, you know, your, your voice is your tool, right? Your, your throat is your tool. So you need to make sure it's all tuned and happy and keep some water by you. As long as it has a closed top, water bottles are um, permitted in all studios, at least the ones I've been in, uh, that could be different from your location. But you're allowed to bring in a water bottle. So do bring that in because it'll help. It'll help. And then also stand if if it's possible. And don't be afraid to use your body. Like I said, it's very physical. And sometimes you have to use your body. If if the character is running, you know, you have to do this motion because it'll help you sound more believable that you're breathing that way, right? Or if you're supposed to be out of breath, you might do some jumping jacks and immediately jump into your lines so you're actually out of breath. So sometimes you do, or, or fighting, right? Sometimes you should throw a punch when you're, Ugh, right? It just, you feel it more. Also, make sure you're prepared for any props you might need. 
Usually you don't need any because they're going to add the Foley, you know, the Walla stuff in the end and afterwards in post-production. So like punching, you don't actually have to, you know, punch or knock on the door. They'll add a knock on the door sound. But I have done a few characters who have eaten and I have tried doing it just my mouth. And it's actually the client preferred me grab something that is similar to what they're eating. If it's an apple, I'll bite into an apple. Maybe chewing a piece of gum if you don't have any food around you or if you're on a, a limited diet. But try to mimic what they're biting into. Is it a crunchy chip, yeah. potato chip, or is it soggy? You know, is it a sandwich that tastes bad and they're going to be like, ew, this is gross. You know, keep that in mind of what you might need in the studio or near the studio. Obviously, don't bring a full, you know, entree into the studio with you. Just enough for that bite sound is is enough. But um, just it's just an extra thing that if you're prepared, then the client is more likely to to you know work with you again because you know what you're doing and you're nice and you're prepared. So I think yeah, that's that's it. That is all I had prepared. So I am ready for questions. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, thank you. <laughs>